All right, so let's go ahead and look at some of the information necessary to complete the math type questions for test five. Okay, so we have the very first question in the module. So folder 5A, question number one, and pretty simple formula to look at. We're actually gonna make it easier in just a minute. So the magnetic field component of electromagnetic wave is equal to the electric field component divided by the speed of light. Now, here's the important part. The speed of light is not allowed to change. So if that's a constant, we were to take a ratio of the you know different versions of this question, then the only thing that actually is allowed to change is just the electric field component. And so if I take that component, the one and only component we're allowed to mess with, and I multiply it by some factor to scale it up or down, then we have a very particular predictable answer for what that's going to make. We really just get the factor back again. So I'm plugging in the factor and nothing else. And so obviously that's the same number. Um, now you may have noticed a long time ago if I'd gotten right here and there was nothing else than anything I plugged into that, any change I made was just immediately going to be the same number. Um, so watch out for this one though anyway. It's not going to make sense to say that the, the speed of the wave is going to change because that's the speed of light and it has to be the same. So watch out for that little trap. Okay, so our next formula. Um, as it turns out, the wavelength of a radio station um, is related to its frequency. So the name that they give is related to um, broadcasting frequency. So whatever that is for this random example, 104.9 megahertz, um, that would be a station called 104.9. Okay, and we can see what that turns into as a wavelength. So lambda, so think wavelength L for lambda, like you can kind of even see as part of the shape, kind of looks like an L, is equal to the speed of light, because radio is an example of an electromagnetic wave, um, divided by whatever frequency we're given. Okay, so keep in mind that the speed of light is here again. And so the speed of light is going to be held constant. So that's going to basically cancel out in comparing different versions of this question. The only thing that really is going to scale up or down or change is the frequency. Be careful not to just get rid of C and just look at frequency. Um, you have to remember that it's not only frequency. The placement's important. It's the reciprocal of frequency. So the frequency goes higher, then the wavelength goes lower. And then, you know, of course, the opposite is true. Okay, so from here, let's say that I take my frequency and I multiply it by some factor. Then I have to keep in mind that the top is just a 1 or a speed of light if I really wanted to put that. But that's going to cancel between different versions of this question. And so I have 1 divided by whatever that factor is. So it's going to give them the reciprocal to that factor. Um, so since mine was one half, reciprocate that, it's going to turn into two. Your numbers won't be as clean, but like I've said a number of times before. That's what calculators are for. So that'll help you finish up. Okay, um, then this one we really need to, to be careful when we look at it. Um, so observe time and proper time um, are unusual concepts. Uh, we've talked about this more in previous notes, so you can watch videos or read in the book for information there. The observed time is what somebody outside of an event sees, and the proper time is what somebody inside the event sees. And so these scale by an unusual factor um, called sometimes gamma factor or the Lorentz factor. Okay, so delta t, the observed change in time for somebody watching, is equal to gamma, that Lorentz factor, gamma factor, multiplied by the proper change in time. So whatever the person inside the event observes. Okay, then gamma is this whole big ugly thing. It's one divided by the square root of one minus V over C. So basically what portion is the um, moving object moving compared to the speed of light? Uh, but squared. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot happening here. And so if we bring these together, if I know what gamma is equal to, and I see where that would go in some other formula, then I can plug these into each other. And so my observed time is going to end up being this times the one up top. So um, 
the proper time divided by, because like I said, it absorbs into that one, this big square root. Okay, which, uh, you know, it's kind of scary looking, and I, I agree on that. And especially if I try to make small changes on this, it's going to be really difficult to predict what's going to happen. Um, so, like, it doesn't make sense at all to change the velocity of the wave. Like, you're not going to change the C for the speed of light. But if I change the velocity of the thing moving, then, you know, even then, that's in a ratio. That's been squared. It's finding a difference. It's a square root. We're dividing by that thing. That's just going to be really difficult to see what's going on. The only variable here that we can reasonably track and make predictions based off of then is the original proper time. So let's say that this proper time is multiplied by some factor. So we'll use a half for convenience. Then if I plug that new version of the question in and I go solve some things, I'm going to have a ratio of the new proper time compared to the old proper time of 0.5. And as long as I don't change any of the other numbers, whatever horrible thing this turns into is still going to be the same horrible number later. Um, and so stick those in a fraction with each other. They're going to reduce down and give one. And so technically that just cancels. Um, and all that we have left is just the factor. So if the question asks you about anything else, um, if it asks you about the velocity, if it asks you the speed of light, those things, those aren't going to be easy to change. Um, if it says that the relativistic factor changes, so if it kind of backs up to this version of the formula, then, you know, I guess bonus formula, something we can pull from here. If we're, in fact, I'm going to wall this off. If we're not looking at a piece of gamma, but we're looking at all of gamma in one go, then if gamma is adjusted by some factor, oops, we're not equating these, but we're saying that it's changing in some way. Then we would have that factor 0 0.5 multiplied by the proper time isn't going to be changing here. And that would give us the factor back again. So the only thing we can do with gamma or this whole square root thing is if we know the answer of everything together and we change that in one go. That's what we can solve for. Um, but otherwise, we just have to rework the question, see what it turns into, or certain changes are going to be actually impossible and things we can't solve. Okay, then if we look at this in the other order, so notice that that was question four and this one's question five from our previous notes, then it takes basically just the same thing and you go backwards. So we're looking at the same starting formula, that the observed time is equal to gamma multiplied by the observed time, I'm sorry, the, the proper time. Um, if we're going to solve for this proper time, then what's going to happen is we're trying to get this thing by itself. So we're going to have to get rid of gamma. And so that's going to tell me then that my proper time, delta t0, is equal to my observed time divided by gamma, that Lorentz factor. Okay, um, like before though, if it says that it changes the velocity or the speed of light, anything like that, we're not going to be able to mess with this. Only if it's changing uh, the full gamma all in one go. So let's look at that real quick since we're already talking about it. If we mess with gamma and we multiply it by some factor, then we'll take, <coughs> excuse me, in this case, half of gamma plug it back in and see what's going to happen. So we could rework this original question, plug in 2.06, and then see how the new answer compares to the old answer. Um, but what would happen then is that the observed time is unaffected. So, you know, if we were to stick, say, 588 over 588, it would reduce and give 1. And then the ratio of 0 0.5 gamma divided by the original gamma is going to give us that factor back of 0 0.5. And so what I have from this, because gamma is on the bottom of that fraction, you should hopefully have seen this coming, uh, but I've got the reciprocal to that factor. And since mine was a nice clean 0 0.5, we got an answer here of 2. Okay, and then actually easier to deal with, um, if this observed time is modified, so say I take the 588 seconds from this question, cut it in half, work it again, 
then we can guess how the answer is going to change. So I'll use that 0 0.5 I've mentioned, as we've used for you know all of these so far. Then that's on the top of this fraction. So I plug in that 0 0.5 for the ratio for how this changed. Then gamma, if it's unaffected, I'd have technically 4.12 divided by 4.12. And those would cancel each other out when I start comparing these values. So that's just going to give the factor by itself. OK, then this is something that you need to pay careful attention to. I've already mentioned a couple of times. Um, but if we're dealing with a laser and something that moves at the speed of light, so understand that the word laser means light, then you know exactly how fast that's going to be going. In the book, there's an example where they run through and they do a proof. Um, so the formula they give us, you've got a whole bunch of information that ends up getting plugged in. Okay, so C is the speed of light, so that's fine. Um, and then V and U are going to change depending on what we're looking at. So we have a moving object, we have something that's observing that, we have something that's moving off of the moving object. And so, you know, that's where we've got kind of a lot of pieces going. Um, now, from this, because you're shooting out something that is light, then U prime, that thing that's being launched out, is also going to be C. And that has a really interesting side effect. So plugging in that into our formula. Oh, come on. I don't know why that glitch happens. Um, then we've got V plus C over 1 plus V times C over C squared. Through a little bit of algebraic manipulation, um, we can cancel a little bit, get a common denominator, make these parts look like fractions. So like here, I can stick this over 1 so it looks like a, a, a fraction. I can cancel C and the exponent here. That's going to make this um, C over C. And in the end, what happens is I have V plus C over 1 from the top. And then because I'm dividing this, it's going to flip back around the other way. And I get C from the denominator up top now over, you see, look, C plus V. So I'm going to write that in a similar order what we saw in the other part. And those cancel. And so what I end up getting back again is just C. So there's nothing else to plug in. Um, so if I change the velocity of the ship, so we want to be very careful here. In fact, I'm going to spell these things out. If I change the velocity of the ship, then I get just the answer C back again. And so I would have a ratio technically of C over C. I get an answer of 1 when I compare them against each other. And so that would mean that this does not change. OK, but if there's a version of the question that says we're changing um, the velocity of the wave, well, the velocity of the wave is the speed of light, and it should stay the speed of light. Um, and so we can't change the speed of light. So we would say in that case, does not make sense. So terrible handwriting, my pen acting up, but hopefully that's close enough to be able to read. So you cannot change the speed of light. And it doesn't matter how fast the ship is going. If you shoot out a laser, which is light, then that laser is going to be moving at the speed of light. OK, so that was the last one we're going to look at from the module folder 5A. we we'll look at a few questions from module folder 5B. So this is the first one from that group. Um, and as it turns out, it's a pretty easy one to work through. So we've got the energy of a wave, in this case a radio signal, is equal to something called Planck's constant, which is the letter H as a symbol. Um, as a number, can change depending on what the units are. Um, but you take that constant and you multiply by the frequency of the wave you're looking at. Now this is important because Planck's constant is, uh, well, a constant like the name says. Then all we're really looking at here is just the frequency. OK, so if the frequency changes, 
So say I had some old frequency and then I change that to be half, then that's going to mean that I'm plugging in technically 0 0.5 into the only thing that I'm allowed to change. And so I'm just going to get that factor back again. If anything else changes, it doesn't make sense. Planck's constant can't change. The speed of the wave can't change because it's moving at the speed of light. So the frequency is really my only degree of freedom here. I can't modify anything else. Okay, then we haven't had too many of these, um, but this is a question that technically, depending on how you look at it, is a, a set of questions that can be connected to each other. Um, so we have this formula. Um, this is the energy released from a transition of an electron and then the electron dropping back down again is equal to um, we've got this this special constant, so a negative 13.6, which, like I said, is a constant, multiplied by 1 over the level it starts at minus 1 over the level it ends at. Then there's kind of an interesting thing that's going to happen here. It's not perfect, but it's going to work out well enough for most of these for us to make a guess. Um, and then the fact that it says most likely allows us to get away with that. Um, because these are reciprocals and they're squared, m has to be a bigger number than n for this to be a transition to drop down. So look at our examples like 5 to 3, 5 to 2. Could have been 5 to 1, but this one says 2 to 1. But 1 over 5 squared is 0 0.04. And compared to any of the rest of these, they end up being very small. Um, and so effectively, all we're really tracking on this, um, and in fact, this is even a constant anyway, so that can be sort of dropped and, and canceled. Um, the negative signs from here cancel, and really all we're interested in is 1 over n squared. Okay, but here's the thing. We have a given chart for different values for wavelength and frequency and energy, um, that are given to you in your module folder. Um, and then so, in fact, we can estimate answers a little bit more clearly. If we keep the 13.6 on this one, um, then we take 13.6 and we divide by, say, 1 squared because it landed on a 1. Then we're going to get a really huge energy, and that's going to be definitely an ultraviolet wavelength. So if n equals 1 then that's going to end up telling us that we're definitely in ultraviolet. Okay, um, if n equals 2, so whatever it starts on, if it lands on 2, then we end up with is 13.6 divided by, be careful that's not 2, but 2 squared, so 4. And so that's going to end up being... Um, it can be on the edge a little bit between visible and invisible, um, but most likely it's going to end up being visible light. So not every single case, but it does say most likely. In the example that's here dropping from 5 to 2, um, because this ends up being one of the higher energy ones, uh, we end up with violet. So violet's higher energy. Ultraviolet means beyond that, even higher energy. So notice how this, this corresponds, um, color to energy. And then the last option that might be asked from you, I don't think, think it goes any higher than this, um, and you'll see why it doesn't really matter anyway. But if we land on n equals 3, then remember that this isn't 13.6 divided by 3, but it's 13.6 divided by the square of 3, so divide by 9. And so that's going to make this a considerably smaller energy. Um, because it's lower energy, as it ends up being actually less than red or inferior to red, then we label that as infrared or IR. Okay, so this one we're not really comparing different ones. We're just seeing, you know, what the, the options are um, from different scenarios. So again, we're saying most likely, but for this one, if it lands on three, it's going to be so low energy that it's definitely infrared. The only one that's technically a little bit variable is landing on two can sometimes be um, outside of the visible range. But most likely it'll be visible. Okay, then number nine from this group. 
So almost the end of what we're looking at from 5b. We want to calculate the energy created from x-rays. Okay, so we want to find the difference in energies, but what we have to be careful about is that x-rays are often using um, high proton numbers in metals or could be a few other things, but typically dealing with, with high proton numbers. And so in our previous examples, if you look back through the notes on the old videos, then we basically just decided that Z was one because we were dealing with hydrogen and didn't really include that information in, in most of those questions. But if Z is not one, like in this example, it was 67, then that's gonna make a considerable difference. So that's why a lot of times X-rays are measured in kilo electron volts or KeV, because they can have very big answers. Okay, um, what this is gonna do then, the change in energy or the energy released when an X-ray is created, we're gonna have that negative 13.6 number that pops up again, okay? But then because it's not hydrogen, we need to specifically plug in Z squared or the number of protons squared. And like I said, that's where this can change quite a bit. Okay, and then we're gonna have whatever it started on, the reciprocal of that squared, minus whatever it landed on, so the reciprocal of that squared. Okay, so we have to be really careful how we're looking at things here. Um, so if you're changing one of the transition numbers, then you know we don't know how that's going to do as a reciprocal and then subtracted with or from something. So we can't change just one of those. So let's hold off on that. Let's see what that's going to do in a minute. We look in, We can look at Z. Um, so if you were to change Z, so let's say that we took that and we cut it in half. That is technically assuming that it's a number that can be cut in half, that it was even in the first place. Um, but let's say that we, we cut that in half or that we doubled it, that we adjusted it by some factor. Then you do want to remember that this is plugged into the formula squared. So we'd have 0 0.5 squared. Hold on, let me fix it's glitching again. Um, squared. Then if the transition numbers are not affected here, then, you know, again, we don't know what these numbers are. You could work through the example over here if you wanted to. Um, but the ratio of the difference of the square of the reciprocals, which again is a, a whole lot to try to track and say, um, but that's going to be unchanged in this question for only changing Z or the number of protons. And so what will happen then is that you'll get your factor squared. So this could be doubled, it could be one quarter, it could be anything, but we get that factor squared. For my question, that means I'm going to get one quarter of the energy back again. Okay, um, and then, like I said, you can't change one of the transition numbers, but let's say that they were positive and we were allowed to, to change them both. So maybe we could cut them both in half, or maybe we're doubling both of them, or tripling both of them, or what have you. So if M and N are adjusted, so let's say they were both even and we were able to cut them in half and we wanted to see what was going to happen. Then starting out, the 13.6 is a constant of some kind. I left this here in the other one because technically it fixes the sign that's here. Um, then on this one, again, it, it fixes our sign because typically this would give you a negative answer on this part. That's also negative, so it gives us something reasonable. Um, Z is unchanging. So that's going to be one. And then what's going to happen here is because this is happening to both of them, um, then eventually we're going to be able to factor that out. So we'll, we'll see what that's going to do in just a minute. So whatever was originally in here is still going to be preserved, but we can factor out that factor that went in. So think of it as being kind of the opposite of distributed property. What we need to pay attention to is that the placement that was here. So we're going to end up with one over the reciprocal but because these things were squared in the first place, then it's one over the reciprocal squared. So we'll have one over the factor, again, squared. So for me, that's uh, one over 0 0.25, because that's what you get from 0.5 times 0.5. And then the reciprocal of that means it's going to go up by a factor of four. So landing on a lower number like we saw earlier gave much high energies. So I hope it makes sense that it would change in some drastic way. If we were to go the opposite and double these numbers, 
then we would land on a much bigger number, which again gets squared and changes this by quite a bit, and we'd end up with a much smaller answer. Okay, then last one in the group, very similar formula, um, but we're going to carry it just one little step further. So if we want to calculate the wavelength of an X-ray, um, then we need to deal with how the energy changes, and we need to be able to, to plug in um, for the frequency, which is not something that we specifically found before. We just found energy, but energy is related to frequency, and basically we can sort of chain these formulas together. So the first part of that is that you can find the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation if you use H, it's Planck's constant, times the speed of light, um, divided by that change in energy. Now H and C are, are common enough things, and they're both constants, that this sort of grouping even has a, a predictable number that we use for it. So you'll notice it's kind of small. This is 1,240, and then the units are even converted into to nice things. Okay, um, but looking and trying to see how different variables are going to change, we do have to be extra careful here. So we want to remember where the change in energy comes from. So as we saw in the previous question, the change in energy is negative 13.6. So that's just a constant multiplied by the number of protons squared and then multiplied by the difference in the squares of the reciprocals or the reciprocals of the squares technically there's a one involved it can go either way um, but here we will have one over m squared minus one over n squared i don't know why it bleeds over between pages but i don't know it keeps doing it at least it's easy to fix Okay, and then this is kind of messy, but if I know what delta E, the change in energy, is equal to, and I know where it goes in some other formula, then I can substitute and I can plug that stuff in. So that's going to tell me then that my wavelength is equal to HC, that combination of constants, divided by negative 13.6 times Z squared times 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared. My fraction bar was way too short. Okay, then several of these things can't change. So h can't change, c can't change, um, the negative 13.6 constant can't change, and so ultimately what this really ends up being um, is I'm looking at this as 1 over z squared times 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared. Okay, which is going to do potentially some weird stuff because we've got fractions inside of fractions. We've got exponents. So let's, let's work it through. Let's see what we can make happen. If z changes... So let's say z is an even number and we can cut it in half then the 1 is just part of the, the formula now. We took technically the ratio of hc and negative 13.6, and all of that is canceled out. Um, then the ratio of the new number of protons compared to the old number of protons is 0 0.5, but that squared is part of the formula. Okay, and then if m and n, the transition numbers, if they are unaffected, then it's going to be an ugly number that we're going to get from that, but it would be the same ugly number we'd have gotten in the other example. So as long as we're not changing the transition numbers, then that's going to be in a ratio with itself of 1. Basically, 1 says it doesn't change. And so what we get from this is we get 1 over the factor squared. So it's squared and it's a reciprocal. So we've seen this arrangement a few times. Squaring this gives us 0 0.25, which is the same as 1 quarter. Then taking the reciprocal, that's going to flip that up and make 4. Now these kind of have to be clean numbers. You may see that it's halved or quartered or doubled or tripled. Um, these can't really be the same ugly decimals that we've seen in a bunch of the other questions. Just because we're, we're dealing with a lot of whole numbers um, with, you know, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 for our, our reasonable transition numbers. 
OK, and then now, um, like I've said several times, if we change one transition number, if it's M or N, then that we just can't do anything there. But if we change M and N, then not something that we can predict. So if M and N, each of these, both of these at the same time are adjusted by some factor. And again, if they're even, they can be cut in half, or otherwise it could have been doubled or tripled or whatever the number might have been. Then the one that's left here is basically from canceling the other constants. The z, if it's not changed, it's going to be in a ratio with itself of 1 and then squared because of the formula. And then this is where we had to be careful. So we saw a version of this in the last question. In fact, I'm even going to peek, right? So we saw that when this was on the bottom, we were able to factor out the factor, and then it got squared because it was dealing with those exponents there. So it's it's weird, but the same thing's going to happen again. We're going to have 1 over the 0 0.5 squared multiplied by the original transition number. So we can actually work down and see what that's going to turn into. OK, so this is definitely messy. Um, but what we're going to have now is we're going to have 1 over 1 over 0 0.5 squared, OK? So if you decide to make this 1 over 1, which again, I know it looks even worse, um, but that's going to give us then just the factor squared, which for me was 0 0.25. So it, it flips and does a reciprocal, but it's a reciprocal over reciprocal. So it goes back to the original factor and then gets squared. So yeah, that one's definitely busy. Um, that's the last one in the group. So, you know, typically these are the tougher ones. All right, but now we're moving into the last possible section. Okay, so 5C, our last, last module folder that we're ever going to have. Um, okay, so... We have an alpha particle, and we need to sit down and, and say what an alpha particle is. So an alpha particle is a helium-4 nucleus. Now, that's going to be important for a few reasons, but helium-4, HE is the symbol for helium, and then the minimum we're, we're going to need to put here is 4. Now, for convenience, very commonly you'll have extra information provided around. Um, so, like in a lot of cases, it's optional, but you will see on the bottom number, you'll have the number of protons. And then, again, it's optional. You'll see this a lot less, but in our book, I guess they're deciding to be nice. But sometimes you'll even have a number on the opposite corner. And then if you've had chemistry before, you might remember that ions pop up on the top, but they've decided not to mess with this. They're already talking about it as being a nucleus. Okay, so let's talk about what these different numbers mean. Um, and how we can pull information from them. So in general, for any of these symbols, so X for just any element now, um, we have A, we have Z, and we have N. Okay, and let's talk what, about what these mean. So A is the total number or mass number. It's a total number of nucleons. So that's Z protons plus n neutrons, and like I said, that makes nucleons. Okay, then n, the number of neutrons, which is optional, but is often found, you know, on the other side here. Um, you can even kind of look at this other formula and slightly rearrange. If I want n by itself, then I take a, the number of nucleons, minus z, the number of protons, and that's going to tell me my number of neutrons. Let me fix neutrons. There we go. Um, and then the only one of these that's completely direct and easy to read um, and, you know, easy to find from, from most sources is Z is the number of protons. Okay, so from our helium-4 nucleus, um, helium has two protons. You can look up on the periodic table if you need to. Um, and then the helium-4 part tells us the number of nucleons at the top. And like I said, we can work through the rest of that. So we want to see what the question is. If it's the number of nucleons, then that's going to just be 4. Because, again, we can find that right here. 
if the question is asking about the number of neutrons, then think about where that was found. That was out front, or you can take 4 minus 2, and you get an answer of 2. If it's asking for the number of protons, then hydrogen always has the same number, or you can find this here. You can find it on the periodic table if you know how to look, but that's going to give us 2. Um, and then remember, this was a helium-4 nucleus, so think about what that means if it asks you about anything else. Okay, then we're getting into some of the more interesting topics, and we're getting into our, our last few questions. This is, says that some isotope goes through alpha decay and then beta minus decay, also sometimes called beta negative decay. We'll see them as the same thing. Alpha decay releases an alpha particle, which is the same helium-4 nucleus we talked about a minute ago. Then beta minus, um, with beta decay, the, the two most common options are basically where a proton transitions into a neutron or a neutron transitions into a proton. So it just kind of depends on what you're dealing with, um, whether it's minus or plus. Uh, minus is much, much, much more likely, like usually billions of times more likely um, than, than plus. It has to do with an energy conservation and thing, but typically we're going to see beta minus. It's only strange examples that, that use beta plus. Okay, but let's say for some generic element, so I don't care what it is. We have A, Z, and N as our information here. Okay, if it goes through beta decay, then, or sorry, if it goes through alpha decay, then it releases an alpha particle. So remember, that's a helium-4. So it's going to take four away from this. And it's got two protons, so it's taking two away from this. And then, as we saw earlier, it's got two neutrons, so it's taking two away from this number. So what they usually do is they'll show an X here to show that it was some starting element, uh, and then they'll show a Y on the next part to show that it's a new element, because once it goes through decay, it's not going to be the same thing anymore. So from the alpha particle being discarded, that helium-4 thing that we saw in the previous question, the A number, the number of nucleons, is going to be decreased by 4. Specifically, two of those were protons, so, in fact, let me go back and, and fix my Z's to be the Z with the little, like, line through it to make them easier to read. So, in case anybody sees this again later, sometimes Z's are put with little lines through them. Just because sometimes they can look like twos and be hard to read, especially if you've got bad handwriting like I do. Okay, then... Um, Four particles are ejected, two of them are protons, so that's where this minus two comes from, and then two of them are neutrons, and so we're going to have a minus two on this part. Okay, um, but that daughter particle is going to go through decay again. We have what are called decay chains, so it's very often that something is radioactive and it breaks down and turns into something else, and then it, it happens a lot that that thing is also radioactive and will break down again. So we have some new element. I don't want to use Z because Z is already for number of protons. So let's say that we've got some element now, W, because why not? Um, a beta particle is not technically just a particle. It's a combination of, of particles and very small particles and energy. Um, but as part of that, there's a zero at the, the top if we write that out as a symbol to sort of cheat the notation a little bit. So technically what's happening now is you've got A minus 4. Whatever that number is, we're going to take 0 away from that. So if we take 0 away from something, I think you know, that means that it's not going to change. Or in this case, it's not going to change anymore. Um, and then the negative 1, again, that, that's shown on this part, um, we end up with subtracting negative 1, which ends up adding 1. But then you've got to be careful with this because we've already got a minus 2. And basically some weird stuff happens. But we have a neutron that's going to transition into a proton. So where we had lost two protons, we're technically going to get one of those back because of the neutron that transitions. Okay, and then I suppose I've already spoiled this part. We're going to lose another neutron because it's going to transition into a proton. So where we'd already previously lost two neutrons, now we're going to lose three. Okay, so then use this to, to pay attention and see what the question is going to be asking. 
Um, so if it's talking about the number of nucleons and how that's going to change, remember A means nucleon. So A is nucleon or atomic mass. Z means proton. And then N means number of neutrons. Now, technically, these are ions, and then typically, very shortly, get rid of those electrons. So we're not we're not usually going to talk about the electrons on this. Okay. So as the other particles get ejected, we've got too many electrons, and they tend to just shed away. Or if there's a deficit, we tend to find one very quickly. So we're only going to talk about the things inside the nucleus from this. Okay. But as we can see. Minus four here, minus one there, minus three, and then you should even kind of see the balance from this, right? You're losing four total particles. One of them is a proton. Three of them are neutrons once you've done this two-step process. Okay. Then two more. We're going to look at nine and ten, the last two questions, um, actually in the whole class. I was going to say in the set, but, you know, out of everything. So we have this formula that I've very slightly modified from how it's normally seen. So your number of remaining particles, or sometimes A for your amount of material left over, um, is equal to the original amount, or the, that time equals zero amount. So a um, little zero there. And this is where I've made a small change. I've put this as a number two. Normally it's the letter E, which is its own special number, two point, I think, seven, one, seven, two. I forget exactly what. Um, but I modified the formula for this to be 2. Then it's raised to the negative t for the total amount of time, which ironically is a little t, even though it's the bigger amount of time, usually, um, divided by the capital T, which is the half-life, which ironically is typically the shorter amount of time in this, even though it's the, the bigger letter. But whatever. Um, now... I think you can kind of see what's going to happen if the starting amount changes. So if N0, the amount that you have at zero time at the very beginning, if that is affected by some factor, so let's say a half, because why not? Then we're going to have 0 0.5 from the ratio of how this changes, and that's going to multiply by whatever's left. Well, notice that this is raised to the ratio of some stuff, a fraction, things divided and a negative sign. Um, that's going to be really ugly stuff to mess with. But the good news is, if little t and big t aren't changing, then whatever that was is the same ugly number it was before. And so we just get the factor back. Now, what's not nice about this is then if you're changing little t or big t, then we don't really know what that's going to do. Because again, that's raised up on some exponent. Um, you can kind of eyeball it and see, and you got to remember the negative exponent means the reciprocal of this, and then you're raising that to some power. Um, but this very ugly, or very quickly gets ugly, so we're not going to really focus on that too much. In those cases, you'd really just want to work the question again and see what's going to happen. All right, and then last one, uh, we get what probably is going to look like the world's ugliest proportion. Um, but if we take that formula and we resolve it around and we try to get to those those different t values, um, unfortunately, we're trying to solve for something that's an exponent. And it's not the same as having something like x squared and you do a square root to get rid of it. If we want something that's in the exponent, then we have to find the opposite process of exponentiation, which even sounds weird on its own. Uh, if you've had college algebra, then you've probably learned about this. If not then, you know, it, it just ends up being kind of a fancy calculator button for us. But the opposite of exponentiation is logarithm. And in particular, we tend to use the natural logarithm because of that number slash letter E I was talking about a minute ago. And we're going to take the, the natural log of the ratio um, originally of what is remaining compared to what we started with. But that would end up giving us a negative sign, which cancels part of the exponent we had before. So we flip and take the reciprocal there. So again, I'm showing you a little bit of a strange version of this formula compared to what you normally see. But this part being flipped fixes a sign change on something else. Then that 2 that we had 
um, that was the base earlier, right? It was two raised to some other things. Also needs a natural log because we're breaking down the exponents and basically freeing up those pieces. So these things are going to look super ugly. Um, natural log of two is something like 0 0.693148, I think. I don't know. It's, oh, actually. No, I guess I didn't write it in this. I just did that number times 49. Uh, but it's 0 0.693, and then I forget what the decimals are. Um, but anyway, these things basically free up our exponents. They bring them out into the real world where we can solve for them and see what's going on. Um, so over here, we're going to have the little t that was in that exponent, and then the big t. There's no negative anymore, because technically that flipped this thing around in some steps that I didn't show. If you're interested in seeing that full process and solving, then you know send a request to your instructor, um, and I'm sure they can show you. All right, then if we're looking for half-life, then you want to remember that it's the capital T here. So like I said, world's ugliest proportion, cross multiply, eventually divide. Um, and if you do that, then you will get that the half-life, capital T, is equal to little t times the natural log of 2, which is, again, clearing up the base that's in the original formula, divided by the natural log of this ratio of the uh, original amount divided by the remaining amount. Okay, so I I hope you're wary of this question, that it, it, it makes you suspicious and, and concerned because, you know, it, again, it's super ugly looking. You've got special buttons on the calculator you would need to work this through. Um, the only variable that looks clean and easy to find is this T right here. So let's start with that and then talk about what's left over. So let's say that t is affected by some factor. So we go and we take half of that time. Um, and if nothing else changes, we have the same starting amount, same ending amount. 2 is just the number 2. Natural law is going to affect those in predictable ways as long as you know what the numbers are and you don't change them. Um, then what we'll have is 0 0.5. Technically, natural, two, natural log of 2 is a constant. It can cancel. Um, and then the natural log of that stuff together is going to be um, in a ratio with itself, and even though it's horribly ugly, it's going to cancel and, and give one. Then we get just the factor back again. Okay, and really, <laughs> that, that's all we can do. Because if you change only the, the starting amount or ending amount, then you're going to end up taking a natural log of either that number or the reciprocal of that number, and that's going to be really ugly. Um, if you change both of those by the same amount, well, that's something we can probably do. Um, but if we change both of those by the same amount, then... Oh, let me pick a color. Let's do, let's do this one. Okay, so let's say that N0 and N are both affected by some factor. So both of them are, are multiplied by half, cut in half. Okay, well then, the looking through the other variables, t is not going to be messed with. Natural log of 2 is just some constant, so it would cancel itself if we were to divide the answers. And then we'd have the natural log of 0 0.5. I'm going to show this a little bit more cleanly here. 0 0.5 times the starting amount over 0 0.5 times the ending amount. Okay, and so what's going to happen with that is the 0 0.5 and the 0 0.5 there are going to cancel. And then the natural log of N0 over N is going to be in the same ratio as, as what the original question had. Um, and then you'd actually end up getting an answer of 1, which in the end means that this does not change. So if you have the starting material and half the ending material, um, then everything moves along at the same rate and you end up getting the same half-life. Okay, um, I know a few of these in this group were a little bit interesting. Um, the different formats, some of them even required multiple questions to look at at the same time. Um, but hopefully this gives you a better understanding on those.